Hello and welcome to the Bloom Channel. My name is Ian. I'm one of the leaders here at Bloom Church. Today's message by Pastor Kobe is about how the Holy Spirit operates in the lives of believers, specifically how the Holy Spirit empowered and went before Paul and Barnabas on one of their missionary journeys. Hope the message blesses you. You have an excellent day. So we're talking about unity in the Holy Spirit. And so how do we, how do we see unity? Well, the unity happens when the body of Christ comes together in vulnerability, right? In openness, in transparency. And uh, it's really beautiful. I think when, when men, particularly in a world that's kind of, um, how do I say this? In a world that sometimes set, sets men up in a way to uh, not show their vulnerabilities and not show and not be real with themselves. For us to create a space for that to happen, I think is really special. And I think it was really, really powerful what happened. And um, I'm excited for the women as well. Uh, this, this, uh, this next, well, in April, to be able to experience that as well. And so, um, yeah, yeah. So while we're jumping over here, jump open to Acts chapter one, because uh, we're going to start off today just with a reminder about how the book of Acts starts. And remember, the book of Acts is called Acts of the Apostles. But I want to remind everybody again and again that it's actually Acts of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit works through the apostles. An apostle literally just means sent one. That's what the word apostle means. It means someone who's sent out. Okay. And so the Holy Spirit filling the lives of the early believers, particularly the, the, the 12 apostles, the Holy Spirit is filling them and sending them out for a, for a, for a mandate, for a commission, for a specific purpose. And that's to the advancement of the gospel. So I want to read here in Acts chapter one. And I don't know if we can have that on the screen here as well, but Acts chapter one, begins with a very unique mandate by Jesus uh, right prior to his ascension. So I'm going to read it here. This is Acts chapter 1. This is in, uh, in verse 6. So when, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But, verse 8, you will receive what? power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes. And, to, and they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Isn't it interesting? The last mandate that Jesus gave his disciples was not to go out immediately and start proclaiming the teachings and, and, the, and the message and the ministry of Jesus. What were they called to do? They were called to stay where? They were called to stay in Jerusalem to receive the outpouring, the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And from there, they would be sent out to the greater regions, right? Remember, it's Jerusalem. Judea is the next region. Samaria is the next outer region. And then to the ends of the earth. In other words, we start with where we are with what we have. We receive the power of the Holy Spirit. It's like a centripetal force for a centrifugal mission. We're being centered together to receive the power of the Holy Spirit in intimacy with Jesus. We're, being com we're coming together as one to be sent out for a greater mission with greater power, with greater force, and, and with the greater advancement of the message. But it starts with coming together. So they were, what, to stay in Jerusalem, and that's where they would receive power and when they had received power, it says the Holy Spirit would come upon them and you will be my witnesses. So in other words, in order to be a witness, you need to receive, in order to be a witness of the good news, you need to receive what? The power of the Holy Spirit. That if you don't have the Holy Spirit living within you, if you aren't filled with the Holy Spirit, that your witness of the good news, your witness and your testimony, right? It's not coming from a place of power, of authority. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to whom? Has been given to me. Therefore, go. In other words, Jesus is saying, he's saying, all authority, right, is mine. The same authority that the Father has given me, I now give to you. And likewise, as I have been sent from the Father, 
to do the work of the Father, I am likewise sending you out. But I haven't sent you out as orphans. He says, I'm coming back for you, and I'm actually filling you with my presence along the way so that you'll be pushed with greater power, with greater authority to testify of me and greater works than these will you do. And so Jesus highlights the significance for believers to be filled with, to wait on the power of the Holy Spirit prior, for the, prior to us, prior to believers being sent out for mission, being sent out for ministry. And I think sometimes we can get so caught up in doing the, the work of the Lord that we neglect the Lord of the work, that we can get so caught up in trying to do things for God's kingdom that we actually neglect to be with the king of the kingdom. And I think Jesus is calling us back to recognize that we can't do this without him. That we can't, if we think in our own power that we can witness and we can share the good news, if we think that in our own strength that we can do the ministry, if we think that through what we've been given, our natural abilities, our natural, that we think that we can do it on our own, if that's what we believe, we're going to be gravely mistaken to find out that nothing of significance is going to happen. And I, I believe that miracles happen, but I also believe miracles happen when we've surrendered to the Spirit of God. That when we've said, God, I'm, I'm not trying to do this in my own power. In fact, I realize my limitations. I recognize my, my boundaries. I realize what's possible from me and by my strength and power, but I'm not depending on what I can do. I'm depending on what you can do, God. I'm depending on your power and your authority to come upon me, to fill me, and to send me out. And that's when I think we see the miraculous happen. That's when I think we see some crazy stuff happen, like we see in the book of Acts. And I wonder if maybe the church today at large isn't perhaps, maybe, maybe we're not seeing the miraculous because we're not spending time in intimacy with Jesus to receive his power and authority. And we're trying to do it in our own strength. And Every time we try to do things in our own strength, friends, it always doesn't end well because it leads to depletion. It leads to exhaustion. It, it leads to burnout. It, it leads to just a model of doing ministry that doesn't align with the footsteps of the Savior when he was on earth. And we see Jesus time and time again comes to the Father. He leaves. He wakes up early in the morning to spend time with the Father before everyone else had, had risen. He, he spends time in devotion with the Father to receive power. And likewise, we are called to spend time in the secret place with the Savior to receive the power to be sent out for a greater mission that we could not fulfill on our own accord by our own strength. And so we see this model time and time again through the books, the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And I want to jump today to Acts chapter 13. That's our, that's our text in view today. And talking about the Holy Spirit, we see the activity of the Holy Spirit pop up time and time again in this chapter, in Acts chapter 13. And this is a pretty interesting passage because this passage has to do with, honestly, in, 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 in full regard, it has to do with the uh, powers of evil and darkness and how the powers of evil and darkness are opposing the work and activity of the Holy Spirit. And just like in the New Testament, we see the spiritual warfare taking place. We see it today all around us. But sometimes there's a malaise of blindness over our eyes and we don't really see it because we're not sensitive to the activity of the Holy Spirit and what God is trying to do. And so this is in Acts chapter 13 and talks about Saul and Barnabas. Saul and Barnabas. So now in verse 1, it says, Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was also called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, a lifelong friend of Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were worshiping, look what happened. While they were worshiping, verse 2, the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So question for you, who called these men and set them apart? Was it, the, was it the men, was it the early disciples that said, these guys have good character, or these guys have unique qualities, or these guys are gifted in unique ways, or these guys, we see a lot of talent, a lot of, a lot of potential in these guys. Let's, let's choose these guys and send them apart. No, no. Who set them apart? It was the Holy Spirit that set them apart. It was the verdict of God that set them apart. It was not man's choosing. It was not man's wisdom that set them apart, but it was the Holy Spirit that said, set these men apart that God had given them a specific 
mandate, a specific commission, and he set them apart for this reason. And we see this motif of being set apart by the Spirit, being set apart by God, time and time again throughout the biblical corpus. In fact, in the book of Jeremiah, we see in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, the prophet Jeremiah receives a call from God, and he tells him, before I formed you, in the womb I knew you. Before you were born, the text says, I set you apart. Before you were born, I set you apart. Well, what in the world is that? That means before you even knew, before you even had your first thought when you were born, God had already chosen you for a specific mission. This highlights the sovereignty of God over our lives. This highlights that, that God, even before we were known, that God had seen us and set us apart from birth for a specific mission, for a specific purpose. And when we know that God sets us apart, when we know that it's not simply uh, you know, our own unique ability, our own talents, but that, that, that kind of validates the call of God, but it's that God himself says, no, no, I'm, cho I'm choosing you for a specific purpose even before anyone else can see that purpose come to fruition. That I see it before they see it. That I see it before the community sees it. That I, that I see it before anyone else saw it. And you may not even see it right now because it may have not come to fruition in your life. But God has set you apart as a believer for a unique assignment, for a unique purpose to advance the gospel of the kingdom. And so he says this to Jeremiah. He says, I set you apart and I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. So here we have, we mean known before you were even known in the womb. You were being set apart and you were being appointed by God. And I, this indicates that Jeremiah was set apart by God before his birth to be a prophet, to be an instrument for the Lord's work. Or you have in Luke chapter 1, verse 15, you have the story of John the Baptist. And in Luke chapter 1, verse 15, the angel Gabriel announces to John the Baptist, his parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth, that John will be great in the sight of the Lord and will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. So once again, you have the Holy Spirit's activity. You have the Holy Spirit setting certain individuals apart for a specific assignment. And John's assignment was what? Prepare ye the way of the Lord. To, to set, to be a highway, to prepare the coming of the Messiah, right? To, to be a forerunner. And he was baptizing in the Jordan River and he was preaching a baptism of repentance, the Bible says. To be a forerunner for the coming of the Lord. And then when Jesus came, he says, no, no, no. But John says, I'm not the guy. They're asking him, if you're the, cho if you're the one who was foretold, he says, no, I'm not the guy. He says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. What was John the Baptist set apart for? John the Baptist was set apart to prepare the way of the Lord. He wasn't the, the, the main hero of the story. He, he, had a, he had a very subpar role, but his role was nonetheless significant. And the Holy Spirit says, I'm setting this man apart for a very specific purpose, a very specific assignment. And it's not the main assignment during that time, but it's nonetheless a significant assignment. And why I think that is important today is because we all come with different roles. The body of Christ, we all come with different assignments. Not every assignment from the Holy Spirit looks the same. Not every assignment that's being set apart by God looks the same. And sometimes we choose to highlight the members of the body that seem to get the most attention. And we say, oh, I want to be a prophet. I want to be able to speak in tongues. I want to be able to do these things. At the same time, we ignore the, the, the more modest, the lesser parts of the body. We, kind of, we don't give those ample highlights. But the Holy Spirit, in this sense, has set John apart for a secondary role. And I think that's so significant because sometimes we, 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 we view the, the body as like, you know, one part is greater than the other. And Paul says, no, 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 no. He says, can the eye and the tongue, they have different functions. They have different purposes. The ear and the eye, they do different things. They, they're all working in tandem. They're all working together for a specific purpose, for a larger mission. And it comes together under the sovereignty of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. Not one is greater than the other but they're working together for one greater purpose. And that's obviously for, for the coming of the Savior, to prepare hearts, to prepare minds, to receive the good news of Jesus. And I think that's so, so important that the Holy Spirit sets people apart 
for a specific assignment, for a specific purpose. And so, jo- and so uh, Paul here is Saul and Barnabas. They're being set apart for a specific work. He says, for the work to which I have called them. So let's look what happens here. So verse 4 says, So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as uh, Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet. His name was Bar-Jesus. I always think that's an interesting name. This guy's name was Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. I, I also think this is an interesting point to, to highlight, that the Christian faith wasn't simply a, a faith that was drawing and attracting people of low socioeconomic status or uh, of low education. Here we actually see a man, Sergius Paulus, a man of great intelligence. He was an intellectual titan. And the Christian faith and the teachings of Jesus and the teachings of the early believers were drawing these people of intelligence, were drawing these men who were well-learned and taught also to the way of Jesus, also into the faith. And so it wasn't just a message for the, this divide of socioeconomic status, you know, where people of higher intelligence and higher of socioeconomic status were rejecting the message and people of lower socioeconomic status were attracted to the message. It was a message for all. It was a message for rich and poor, slave and free. Doesn't matter who you were, the kingdom of God was here. The kingdom of God was at hand. And it was a message for all to come to repentance. And so Paul, Saul and Barnabas here, they're proclaiming the word of the Lord. And, and what happens here, this, this magician or this sorcerer, other translations put it, Elemis the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the what? Filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, here we go. Filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, you son of the devil. Can you imagine right there? You son of the devil. You enemy of all righteousness. Very strong language. You enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit. And all villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? Look at that. And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see for the sun sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went out about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the Lord's teaching. Well, this is pretty, there's a lot here. Number one, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. It says Paul being filled. So not only was Saul or Paul, right? You know the difference? Saul was his name prior to the road to Damascus. And after the road to Damascus, he had a conversion experience. And so his name went from Saul to to Paul. And it represents his transformation. God also gave him a new name. He gives us a new name as well. He speaks a better word over us after we come to faith in him. Paul had a conversion experience. He was transformed. And so he had a new identity in Christ, a new identity. That's what we have in Jesus. And what takes place here is he's filled with the Holy Spirit, coming against the powers of evil and darkness, a magician, a sorcerer, right? Who's opposing the faith, who's setting himself up in opposition to what Paul and Barnabas are teaching, right? There's a real enemy, friends. There's real powers of evil and darkness. And there's a malaise over even our cultural moment where people don't even recognize the demonic influences that are happening in our society today. We don't even recognize them. We, we label it as uh, commonplace or we, we label it as uh, just, that's just pop culture. No, there's some things that are just straight up demonic. Like it didn't, it didn't, it doesn't take too long just to watch this, the, the, this last year's Super Bowl game and, and see when there was certain individuals sitting beside, you know, some other pop celebrity culture and doing some very interesting things like the demonics all over the place. It's just whether we have eyes to see it. And right here in the book of Acts, we see that there's the demonic taking place of a sorcerer, right? Who's, t- who's in this text, he's opposing the message of the faith and what does Paul call him? He says, you, you son of the devil. 
he recognized it exactly for what it is. You man of old deceit. In other words, sorcery and, ma and, 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 and a magician is literally a form of de deception. It's deceit in its highest form. Remember the story of Moses in the Exodus. What happens is that the magicians do exactly, they mimic and model the activity of God, right? God turns his, his staff into a, a serpent before Pharaoh. And what did the magicians do? They also turn their staves into, into snakes, into serpents, right? There's this, there's this modeling, there's this mimicking of the activity of God and the deception from the enemy. So what we see here also is this, is this mimicking, this modeling, what God is doing through the early believers and healing and, and, and doing signs and wonders. We see different magicians doing it and different sorcerers doing it. And there's another instance in the New Testament where another individual who is also a sorcerer, right? is doing these works, uh, works of God, or sorry, works of, of sorcery. And he sees the activity of the Holy Spirit. And he says, I want that. He says, I'll pay for that. I want that so bad, I'll actually pay a price on it. And he's rebuked there because you cannot buy or purchase the Holy Spirit, right? It's the Holy Spirit's prerogative. It's the Holy Spirit's work. It's the Holy Spirit who di distributes the gifts. You can't pay for it. You can't work for it, right? It's received by grace. And so here you have in Acts 13, you have this spiritual warfare that's taking place spiritual warfare that's taking place. And the way we combat spiritual warfare is through what? The spirit. It's the spirit of God. That Paul is able in this instance to combat the powers of evil by being filled with the Holy Spirit. Number one, if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, it's going to be hard to discern the powers of evil and darkness. Number two, if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, it's going to be hard to oppose the powers of evil and darkness. You need to be set apart for a specific purpose. Once you know your purpose, you're set, up, you're, you're set apart, right? You walk in your purpose, you're going to be opposed. The only way to, to fight the battle against the, the powers of darkness is to be filled with the spirit, right? Through which we go and we, we, we battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of evil and darkness. This isn't a battle of the flesh. This is a battle in the spirit. You don't have the spirit. How are you going to do warfare? So Paul here and Saul, rather, they're being set apart, being sent out for a specific mission, having opposition along the way, being filled by the Spirit of God to rebuke and to dismantle and dismember the powers of evil and darkness. And it's also interesting that this man of deception, Bar-Jesus, or Elemas, he was deceiving others, but what happens to him? He was putting the blind over others, but what had happened to him? The irony of this text is rich. He was blinded himself by God. In other words, you're going to blind other people. The Lord's going to blind you, right? You're going to blind people to deception. The Lord is going to keep your eyes closed evermore. This, the, the passage itself is dripping in irony here. And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you and you will be blind and able to see the sun for a time. And immediately mist and darkness fell upon him. And he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Isn't that interesting? That here the proconsul was converted. His conversion experience was based on two things almost. What he had seen and also the teaching of the Lord. Not just experiential knowledge, it's also a knowledge of the teaching of the Lord. So there's two things that take place, and we see this throughout the book of Acts. We see people coming to faith by the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit, through two different mechanisms. Experiential knowledge, a knowledge of the signs, a witness of the signs and the wonders, the healings, the miracles of the early disciples. It's an experience, right? And also the taught word or the proclaimed word. Paul and Barnabas entering synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, proclaiming the teachings of Jesus. And people were astonished when they heard the teaching of the Lord through his disciples. They were amazed at these teachings. And we see this in the next, uh, in the next pericope here in, in, in when Paul and Barnabas enter Antioch. And they begin to preach from the scriptures. They begin to preach from the scriptures. And, and what does it say? After they begin to preach from the scriptures and, and teaching the, 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 Jewish, uh, the Jewish people in Antioch on the Sabbath day in the synagogue, they begin teaching them from the prophets and they quote 
the Psalms and they're quoting uh, the various prophets. And, and he, for example, it quotes uh, here in verse 35, it says, Therefore, he says also in another Psalm, you will not let your Holy One see corruption. For David had, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God has raised up did not see corruption. He's talking about Jesus. In other words, Paul is and Barnabas are using the scripture to convict and to convert the hearts of the Jewish people in Antioch. So it's not just an experience by signs and wonders. It's also by the taught word of God that people were coming to faith. Isn't that amazing? It's both, it's an experience, it's experiential, but it's also, uh, it also, it's a matter of the, the intellect. It's like the emotional and, and also the, the, the intellect are working hand in hand. It's like this experience of God and also this knowledge of God. Now that's, that's important. I really think that's important. It's not one or the other. It's both and. You don't have a knowledge of God, right? But you have an experience of God, right? You're, 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 you're still going to, you know, only have half the picture. If you have an experience of God, but you don't have the knowledge of God or the knowledge of his word, you're only having half the picture. The whole gospel is an experience with God and a knowledge of Christ. To know Christ, I consider all things lost. In comparison to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ. Not just tapping into the signs, not just seeing the wonders, but it's a knowledge of Christ as well. And so we, we see this model throughout the book of Acts. And look what happens when they preach the taught word. Look what happens in verse 30, 30, uh, 42 in chapter 13. It says, as they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered. Look at that. Not just one synagogue, but the entire city showed up. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. And began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge, judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the whom? To the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. There we go again, appointed to eternal life. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But look what happens. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went out to Iconium. And the disciples were what? Filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. The disciples were what? Were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. In other words, you're filled with the Holy Spirit. A byproduct of being filled with the Holy Spirit is joy. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, right? The fruit of the Spirit is kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. The Holy Spirit brings elements into our walk, into our devotion, into our discipleship that are revealed and made manifest to others around us. That when we're walking in tandem with the Spirit of God, the transformation that takes place is, it, within us is so revealing to others. It, it's like it's joy. It's bubbling over that you can't help contain. You can't keep it to yourself. It's like you need to share about it. If you're filled with the Spirit, the byproduct of the Spirit is joy. The byproduct of the Spirit is kindness. The byproduct of the Spirit is love, is gentleness, self-control. The byproduct of having received the Holy Spirit is power. It's power, friends. And I, I don't think we recognize the power that lives within us. It's the same power that rose Jesus from the dead is alive and well in you and I. Are we living lives that are empowered by the Spirit or are we just trying to do things in our own strength, by our own ability, 
by our own resource, by our own intelligence and our own intellect, by our own wit and cunning? Are we doing things according to how we think it, the job is going to get done? Or are we doing things to what the Spirit has told us to do? Are we doing the things that he has called us towards, not just the things we want to do or the things that we will to do or the things that we desire to do, but what has the Spirit spoken over us? What has the Spirit set us apart for? What are we empowered by the Spirit to fulfill and to co- accomplish? Is it to do our own bidding? Is it to do our, our, our own thing and to kind of go journey and have fun and live a life of happiness and build a lot of resource? Is that what life is about? Or has God set us apart before we were even born in our mother's womb for a specific purpose and assignment to be filled by the Spirit, to be empowered by the Spirit, to oppose the powers of evil and darkness and to flip an upside down world right side back up again for the kingdom of God, for his glory, for his message. We have been called for a centripetal force, a coming to Jesus for a centrifugal mission, a being sent out to every nation, kindred, and tongue, first in Jerusalem, then in Judea, Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. That the mission is great, but the power that's within us is greater. And until you recognize the power that's behind you and within you, you will never be sent out in authority and strength to fulfill the assignment that God has set you apart for. You cannot outperform. You cannot outperform how you view yourself in the Lord. I'm going to say it again. You cannot outperform how you view yourself in the Lord. If you believe that there's little power available to you, there's going to be little power available to you. If you believe there's much power available to you in the Lord, there's going to be much power available to you in the Lord. As you ask, you will receive. He who asks for much, he will receive much. He asks for little, will receive little. According to the measure of faith, it will be done and given unto you. I believe that when Jesus is talking about asking him, asking him in the Gospels, it's in the context of receiving the Holy Spirit. He says, ask and you're going to receive. If a bad father can give good gifts to his children, how much more so will your father who is good give the gift of the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? God is asking us to ask him for the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can get this thing done. So that we can fulfill his assignment on earth. So friends, do you believe that the power behind you and living within you, the Holy Spirit, is active and alive? The same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead lives within you. When you believe that and just can, don't just conceptualize it, but truly believe it, that's when I feel like amazing things happen. Crazy things happen. Bold things happen. Things that change people's lives and and future generations happen when you truly believe and are attuned with the power of the Spirit that lives within us, just like Paul, just like Barnabas, being set apart for a mission and assignment. So, Lord, may our prayer be this. May our prayer be, Lord, what have you set us apart for? What have you set my life apart for? What are you calling me to do? What are you calling me to be sent out for? What specific assignment, specific purpose have you called me for? And that only takes place, friends, in the context of intimacy with God. That unless you have that intimacy with God, unless you're spending time with him in the secret place, you're not going to know what the assignment and mission that he has for you. So it's spending time with Jesus to know and receive the power of Jesus to fulfill the mission of God for our lives and for the world around us. So God, what are you calling me to do? What is my, what are you setting me apart for? God, now that I know what I'm set apart for, may you fill me with the power to fulfill the assignment and the great commission that's before me. God, don't only fill me and use me, but allow me to experience the joy of the spirit that's within me. And may other people see that joy as I go along the way. Friends, that's the Acts 13. It's the setting apart. It's the filling of. And it's being filled with joy of the Holy Spirit. A beautiful thing. When we ask for it, he gives it. So let's ask for it. Let's let's keep it at its center just as the early believers kept it at the center of their mission, the center of their focus, the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray.